Cue up Randy Newman, cue up Sinatra. Don't care what you cue up. We know that we have a World Series. It is a really bad week to be carbon emissions from a jet because we're going to be going New York to L.A. in the World Series. Dodgers, Yankees, the most common World Series matchup we have gotten in Major League Baseball history is happening again for the first time since 1981. We're going to talk about how we got there recapping game four and five of the ALCS game five and six of the NLCS. We're going to save the world series preview. I think we're going to do that on Wednesday. We'll find some other fun stuff to do over the course of the week, but our ALCS recap is all brought to us by bet MGM, the king of sports books and remember folks, they got something new for this postseason, but it ain't new anymore. Cause we've been all over it. Bet MGM sportsbook account holders who opt into the bullpen jackpot promotion and place a straight bet of at least $10 on their choice of any MLB player to hit a home run will win a share of a daily $50,000 bet MGM bullpen jackpot. If the player that wagered on it hits a home run that lands in an MLB team bullpen prizing will be paid out in bonus bets that expire in seven days. The offer is going to be available every day throughout the world series and customers. All you got to do place a $10 or more wager on any MLB player, Dodgers, Yankees to hit a home run. If that lands in the bullpen, you will win a share of a $50,000 daily prize. Make sure to use code just baseball for that first bet offer up to $1,500 in bonus bets. If your wager loses to get started gambling problem, call or text 1-800-GAMBLER must be 21 years or older terms and conditions apply. Tell me that wasn't the most electric ad reading of all time because I feel electric. My Yankees are World Series bound. Come on. Yeah, that's old news, though. Um, oh, that's true. what? That's 36 hours old at this it point? It ain't old for me. It ain't old for me. I can tell you that. I know. That Soto Homer, like, I've seen it a billion times over the last 24 hours. So I'm excited to see it a billion more times over the course of this week. Oh, me too. Uh, unfor- unfortunately, I will say, by the way, Jack Peter, on today's Just Baseball Show, it's Monday, October 21st. Um, unfortunately there wasn't like much high leverage, anything in the NLCS we will start with the much lower leverage series, but the Dodgers, uh, did win it. But yes, your New York Yankees are going to the world series. Can you um, say it again? Your New York Yankees are going to the world series. Damn One right. They are. Your New York Yankees are going to the world series. Okay. <laughs> okay let's talk about the NLCS. You ready? We're going to go like lightning quick through the preceding game. Cause we've got two games to recap because it's the weekend roundup good job um, good but we, we've got we've got two of them so i will talk about nlcs game five just for a little bit but we'll spend the bulk of the time on game six same deal with the cs we, on the al side we'll you know spend the bulk of the time on game five as opposed to game four but nlcs game five the mets made it three to two it was a 12-6 win in new york on friday right. mets got to jack flaherty right away three run home run from pete alonso Dodgers got one back in the second on a wild pitch from the Mets starter, David Peterson. But then the Mets got Flaherty again in the third with a two-run double from Starling Marte. RBI singles from Francisco Alvarez and Brandon Nimmo. And an RBI triple from Francisco Lindor. Final line on Flaherty. Three innings, eight hits, eight earned, four walks, no Ks. 31 swings at Jack Flaherty pitches produced two whips. Two. He sat 91.4 with a four-seamer. That was down two ticks from his yearly average. Andy Pajes had a solo shot in the top of the fourth. Winker triple, McNeil sack fly made it 10-2. to two. Pajes drilled a three-run homer in the fifth for a multi-homer day. Then Mookie made it a four-run game with a solo shot in the sixth inning. But McNeil knocked another sack fly. Marte played it another with a knock to make it 12-6. to six. Marte was four for five with three doubles. Edwin Diaz worked two scoreless. The silver lining for the Dodgers was this. Jack Flaherty and Brent Honeywell allowed 12 combined earned runs, but they got 23 of the 24 outs recorded by Dodger pitching. All but two pitches in the game from a Dodger were thrown by Jack Flaherty or Brent Honeywell Jr. I'm going to save my point with that, with the silver lining. Your takeaway from this game was what? Bad Flaherty? Good Mets offense? I think a little bit of both, right? Flaherty came out, or at least this was the report that he was feeling sick before the game. 
I don't know if I believe that, but let's believe it because that's the report. Um, clearly didn't have it. 90 miles an hour, not great. But Jack Flaherty isn't known for throwing 99 miles an hour. Jack Flaherty is known for his command. He's been pinpoint throughout the entire postseason, throughout this entire season. That's why he was such a big trade deadline candidate. So I do give the Mets a lot of credit, right? You can only hit who's in front of you. And the fact is, Flaherty wasn't at his best. Eight earned Eight earned runs, that has to give a ton of credit to the Mets. But, of course, it is a little bit of both because his stuff was diminished. But eight earned is eight earned. Yeah. I I hear you on it. Like, Flaherty just looked so bad. Yeah, yeah but, I, I mean, eight runs. I mean, guys have yeah, looked bad I, and before. And I'm not it's saying the Marlins could do it. Yeah. Right. Like, I'm not saying that the, the Colorado Rockies in New York are coming out and they're they're tagging Jack Flaherty for, for eight runs or, or in L.A., wherever it is. But – like the execution at that level, like Flaherty just did not meet the postseason standard that like you do need. Um, I think so what it was, was, I think what it was, sorry to interrupt you. I, I think from what I was watching was both of these teams are so freaking good. So good. I mean, the Mets, yeah. I know they lost in six. We're going to continue to talk about it, but the Mets were an incredible, incredible team. So what that showed me is, if the Dodgers didn't have someone lighting it up yeah. at their top, the Mets are going to hit them. Same thing yeah. with the Mets against the Dodgers, right? Manaya didn't quite have it tonight. Dodgers lit them up. So yeah. that's how good both of these offenses are. If you're not pinpoint, if you're not at your best, you're going to get destroyed. The yeah. thing is, the Mets pitchers just weren't at their best much more than the Dodgers weren't at their best, and we saw what the Dodgers did. Yeah, totally fair. Um, so we will go to NLCS game six here. And I'll, I'll bring up this silver lining thing at the tail end. NLCS game six went to the Dodgers. Final score in that one was 10-5 LA. They added, what, three more in the bottom of the eighth. I did not have those written down. But let me tell you about how we got there to that 10-5 game. Scoring got going right away against Michael Kopech, who opened a bullpen game. Pete Alonso was jammed, but like a little one-hopper pop-up on the infield was plucked by Chris Taylor on the backhand. Throw to first was not handled by Max Muncy. It was an RBI single. Whose fault was it that that ball got down the right field line? I thought it was Muncy's. I thought it was Muncy's, too. I yeah, should have caught that. that play. I'm, sure, I'm sure if you asked Muncy, he should have caught that. That was a tough play, right? It wasn't just a bonehead yeah. error, right? No. It, it got him almost off the bag, but hit him in the glove. He's got to catch yeah. it. And I also just think it's funny, like Pete Alonso, the polar bear, big meat Pete, known for crushing homers. Yeah. 40.8 <laughs> miles an hour off the bat. 40.8. It's almost RBI impossible. single. That's an RBI single. In the book. Uh, then in the 46th inning of the National League Championship Series, we got our first lead change. Mm. Tommy Edmond peeled a two-run double down the left field line against Sean Manaya. to play it. Shohei Otani and Teoscar Hernandez. In the third, Tommy Edmond, again, two-run blast, brought Teoscar in with him to make it 4-1. Will Smith followed later in the inning with a tank to dead center field to bring Muncy in with him and push it to 6-1. Mark Vientos chipped away with a two-run homer to bring his postseason RBI total to 14, which leads all of Major League Baseball this postseason, and he cut the deficit to three, but then Shohei Otani, Ripped a diving liner into center that kicked away from Tyrone Taylor, who was sliding. That brought Will Smith home. Francisco Alvarez had a sack fly in the top of the seventh, but then Mookie hammered a double off the base of the wall in left to bring in another. Teoscar had a sack fly. Kike with an RBI single. But Blake Trinan shut it down with the six final outs to get the Dodgers back to the fall classic. I see the vision. I understand why you say it's Trinan. And you said you used the exception of if we're taking a non class A reliever, you go with Trinan. Yep. I mean, class A looked terrible, his final yeah. three outings. So, we'll we can talk about that obviously when we get to the AL. But I mean, now like Trinan is the it guy in a bullpen at this moment with Luke Weaver allowing the homer too. Like, I mean, that is Trinan is, is the guy right now. Here's the thing, though. Like, I don't care about any other production from all the relievers that I compared to him. Like, I don't care that Cade Smith gave up the home run. I don't care that Luke Weaver gave up the home run. They could have gone scoreless. It's still Trinan. 
Like, yeah. I think everybody's just like, when you're watching Trinan, it doesn't look like he's throwing a baseball that everybody else is throwing. Right. The delivery, it's so smooth. It's so effortless. But here's 97 mile an hour turbo sinker. And I think Ethan said it. Ethan Badowski said it in our group chat. He invented the turbo sinker. I think he kind of did. And then yeah. the sweeper from hell. I mean, in that last inning, um, I think it was Mike Petriello that posted the screenshot. I wasn't sure of exactly him, but I saw the screenshot on Twitter where none of the pitches that he got swings and miss on were in the zone. That's trying it. That's how good this stuff is. It where you have like, professional hitters that, yeah. that have been lighting up the scoreboard all, all series, both on the Mets side as well. Yeah. Couldn't touch him, had no shot. I mean, that he is so otherworldly dominant. It's he's disgusting. Disgusting. Yeah. It was it was like just a joke seeing some of those swings and misses on that trine and sweeper. Like it was I mean, it was starting like middle middle and it was peeling into the lefty batter's box. It, it almost looked like amazing. it was starting in the other batter's box. It yeah. would end up in the other batter's box. I don't I don't think a right touches that. Like no. Good luck, Mr. Judge. I have fun with that. Like even Soto, like lefty, like it's going into you, or the turbo sinkers going away. I agree with yeah. you. Righties are screwed, but it's not like lefties have a good shot either. No, lefties are not that much better. <laughs> no. Um, I want to tie it back to the silver lining from game five because I do feel like that really helped the Dodgers in game six. They went with a bullpen game, man. Like there was no designed long man here. Kopech went one, Kasparius got four outs. By the way. Uh, I know a lot of people recently learned about his girlfriend, who is literally the Michael Jordan of field hockey, like won four national championships as a player. As soon as she got done at Carolina, the long time, like uber decorated head coach of North Carolina field hockey retired and she just took over. So she went from four time national champ player to head coach a year later. And won a national title. Like, absolutely insane. Yeah. <laughs> like, good. everything she touches in the sport of field hockey turns to gold. So, like, Ben Kasparius, loved watching you. Unfortunately, you're the beta in the relationship. I don't know what to <laughs> tell you there. But Kasparius, four outs. Uh, Bonda went four um, outs. Brazier, four outs. Evan Phillips for three. Daniel Hudson for three. Blake Trinan for the final six outs. I mean, I, I know that there was some dialogue about Ken Rosenthal's um, on-field hit about can, Dave Roberts. Can, can you explain conceding? that to me? I, yeah. I saw the I saw the uh, the hubbub in our group chat. And I was like, "Oh, what happened?" So I'm actually so, happy to learn about it right now here on the show. Yeah. So there was a hit that Ken had a little bit later in the game, and it was talking about Dave Roberts and his thinking in Game Two and Game Five about essentially punting, pitching wise, and like you look at Flaherty allowing eight and Honeywell going four and what two thirds and allowing four more. Um, You could call that punting because trying and sitting there and Phillips is sitting there and all these guys are sitting here and like, you made it a five run game at a certain point. Okay, great. You know, Ken essentially said Dave Roberts had this like yucky feeling a little bit because it felt like he was going to quote conceding a postseason game and you never want to do that because you Dave don't know Roberts how many games felt you... that. Yeah. Yeah. Dave Roberts felt that he punted it. Yeah. That's what Ken was oh, wow. saying. At least like he was saying, Oh, you know, you have that thought in the back of your mind. Are, are you like, you know, waving the white flag in this game by not going to in Evan Phillips when you're down by four in the seventh inning. Can I say something real quick? Yeah. I kind of think he did do that, but I also yeah. think that that's okay. For sure. Right. So, like, Especially this my scenario. thought is that's exactly what happened. He didn't punt a game from the outset. It, that was a weird message that we sent in there because it was like they were saying that they punted the game from the outset. No. What what Dave Roberts did that I think was actually great managerial moves in two and five, I'll use five as, like, the good example here, is he saw an opportunity to preserve his bullpen for a bullpen game. You're up three games to one you have the chance to save everybody and give them the old double off day. Just do that. I know that's a regular season thing. Like you let guys go out there and eat it. You typically don't see a sacrificial lamb like Honeywell was in game five in the postseason in the NLCS, regardless of what the score looks like. But I do like that Dave Roberts did that because 
at the end of the day, he has three starting pitchers, and one of them got racked that night. Yeah. Like, there's not much of a choice there. Wait, so forgive me. For anybody listening, for you telling me what's going on right now, why is this a thing? Who's upset at this? I think Mets fans Mets fans might have construed it as, oh, Dave Roberts gave us two games. No, that's No, no, he didn't give you two games. No. I, I'm sure that's not what Ken meant. Right. No, not not in the slightest. So, like, I saw that and I was just like, no, that's super wrong. But my my thought on that, my thought on the, the Dodger bullpen usage was I don't think it could have been any better. Yeah. Like, I thought they aced this weekend. I, I mean, I did bring it up after game two where I thought it was Dave Roberts kind of low light of the postseason. And the reason I said that was it did feel like bringing in Knack in that scenario yeah, it wasn't was, the was right white spot. flaggy early yes. yeah it was white flaggy early where i didn't think that he needed to get there but then once it was there like that i felt was his low light and his only low light of the series because game five is a different story when your starter gives up eight like, kind of what are you supposed to do you want to just throw in all of your high leverage guys so i'm sure what ken meant was dave roberts felt he made a bad decision with landon knack and then he kind of had to punt it to get his relievers ready for game three. In yep. game five, his number one pitcher, the guy who got the first start in this series. Now, you can make the argument, it's Yamamoto, whatever. You start game one, he gives up eight. Are you going to then put your high leverage guys in? Probably not. No. So then that makes total sense. He did nothing wrong in game five. I thought the Landon Knack decision was his only bad decision of the playoffs. And I, it's it's a very... I can understand where Mets fans are coming from, from the lens of you just lost. There's a lot of emotion. A reporter who also got dinged for the Machado story yeah. and then comes out here and you feel disrespected. You feel like, what do you mean? Right? You're not giving any credit to the Mets here. It's all about the Dodgers. I understand where they're coming from in the heat of the moment right after this series is done. I get that. I think if this came out, a week later, with the context, nobody would have any problem with it. So I get yeah. where Mets fans are coming from. Very passionate. This whole playoffs has been unbelievable. You take the Dodgers to six, and then the first big story out of it, it felt like the Dodgers were punting, disrespecting the Mets. So no, no. I don't think this that's how warranted. baseball works. Yeah, yeah, I don't think that's I don't think that's actually what happened. Yeah. But I will say I can I can see where they're coming from feeling disrespected in the moment right after yeah. losing this series. I, I, I get it. I think I it's wrong guess. though. I want to be yeah. clear. I think it's no. the wrong reaction, but hey, I'm emotional. Like I could get in the heads of these fans. Yeah. I understand it. I'd be pissed too. Whether I actually feel it, I would be pissed for no right. reason. So I get it. And I might and I might be unemotional to a fault here when it comes to baseball strategy and all that. Cause it's like I didn't grow up with the New York Mets. I didn't grow up with the LA Dodgers. Like I just watched that from a baseball X's and O's, Jimmy's and Joe's perspective. And like at the end of the day, I thought Dave Roberts handled his bullpen <clears throat> given the starter circumstances perfectly in the back half of this series. I think the only one that could have been a little bit of a head scratcher was going to knack too early when the game yeah. was too close but at the end of the day like knack was good for them down the stretch in the regular yeah. season like it, it's not like knack's presence alone was an automatic but white remember flag. it wasn't about just going to knack it was about going to knack seeing no, that just, he doesn't and, have it and yeah. then just letting him kind of get crushed out there yeah. in that situation well, and then, that's what i had the problem with and then it becomes a conversation of at what point do you deem a game out of reach yeah and i think they might have done that Freddie was playing on one leg. <laughs> like, don't forget that. So, I mean, these guys, like, I'm not, I'm not trying to they put, say wait. that they are the, yeah, I'm not trying to say that they're like the scrappy, you know, underdog Dodgers. That's not what I'm saying whatsoever. What I'm saying is they were kind of dealt a crappy hand pitching wise and their future hall of fame. First baseman was playing on one leg this week. He didn't even and play like, the last game and they scored 10. Yeah. I <laughs> oh, mean, <gosh. laughs> Let's let's give the Dodgers some credit here and let's give the manager that is perpetually on the hot seat because he can't get it done in the postseason some credit for handling a depleted pitching staff in the postseason masterfully, borderline masterfully. And maybe the biggest credit to anyone in this entire series, me. 
picking yeah. the Dodgers in six. So me, Dave Roberts, and the Dodgers, congrats yeah. to us. Yeah, no, I, I'd probably go in terms of the pecking order. I'd say it's you, me. Tommy Edmond, <laughs> Dave Roberts, and then I don't know. I still like the Grimace thing, so I'll I'll give Grimace the four spot there. But Rizzler, the Rizzler grabbed the fifth. You see that? Yeah, that was sick. <laughs> Crazy that they got the Rizzler out there in game five. That guy's They're richer than like all, all of, of us combined. So did you know that they had the Hawk to a girl out at the end of the year? Like she just adopted the Mets? Yeah. You know what? I actually, this is not for this podcast, but I think I respect the Hawk to a girl. Well, Have you gone I, on her Twitter lately? All she does is promote like a bunch of charities. She like donates to a bunch of things. Yeah, she wants was, like, to use it for good. Like, yeah, she I was made like, that you know what? Right you started with Hawk Two on that thing, and you you become like a philanthropist. Like, I mean, that's twenty twenty four America right there. That's the yeah, American I, dream. Hey, listen, I I think she <laughs> might be a stand up civilian, but that's beside the point. Um, huge for the Dodgers getting this done. Shohei Otani was what eighteen for his last twenty three with runners in scoring position, and Tommy Edmond had more runs driven in in a single postseason series than any Dodger in their history. This was cool, and Mookie, and Mookie being Mookie. I mean, the entire team. This is as a Yankee fan. This is a terrifying team. Yes. This so. Is- if they're hitting like that, because again, it's not just Mookie. Remember, we brought up the point where Joe Davis said on the call that Dodgers are only going to go as far as Otani leads them, or, you know, there's that common kind of occurrence where the Mets are only going to go as far as Lindor. The Yankees are only going to go as far as Judge. Well, the reason that the Yankees and the Dodgers are in the World Series is because that point isn't true. The Dodgers were led by everybody. Right, yeah. that stat, Otani hitting 818 with runners in scoring position. That's awesome. He didn't even have the highest OPS in the series. Right, that yeah. was Muncie at 1,300 or Mookie at 1,100. Otani, of course, had an OPS over 1,000. Edmund as well. You just keep going down the line. Even Teoscar had a tough series. Great last game. Hit one off the wall, 404 at 112. They are... Will Smith getting the bat going in that last game. And his at-bats just looking better and better as the series progressed. Kike Hernandez. I mean, this team is disgusting. And that's just the offense. Like, who even cares about Evan Phillips and Blake Trinan and Michael Kopech and Daniel Hudson and, like, Anthony Bonda's getting outs and... I hope they'll get Vessia back for the world. Actually, no, I hope don't. they don't, no, don't. get Vessia yeah. back. <laughs> no, but you... The baseball analyst in me thinks they'll get Vessia back. <laughs> yeah. And then the starting pitching, like Yamamoto found it. Flaherty just wasn't feeling well, but yeah, they are uh they're pretty good. They yeah. are uh they're pretty good. Is the Edmund acquisition the move of the deadline? Oof. No jazz, clearly. Right? He just got a couple of hits in the entire playoffs. Yeah, right? That's ready. what I was told. I was told Jazz was the greatest deadline acquisition. Who told you that? <laughs> I don't think anybody told big you media. that. Big and media? Big media? Yeah, no, big media. Big baseball told you that you Jazz Chisholm big was media. the you, you're, you're, I, you're, You love big media. I am no <laughs> doubt a proponent of big media because without big media, mid-sized media would not exist. That's a good um, point. You know what I mean? Like, they are kind of the straw that, yeah, you know what? We're the straw that stirs the drink. Big media is the drink. <laughs> they might just be the cup or like something. Like We're a couple of ice cubes chilling it down. I think so. And like, you need ice cubes to enhance the drink, no doubt. You need ice cubes to enhance the drink. But, but like, the no, people Edmund... that said jazz is is the second coming of the Messiah are like big media. And they are so important to the game of baseball. So, and the second biggest deadline acquisition might be Michael Kopech. I know he did give up a run, but this dude has been diabolical with that 102 mile an hour fastball. I mean, just blowing cheese. Yeah, the Dodgers killed the deadline again. Maybe the third best, Jack Flaherty. I mean, they destroyed the deadline. No, I mean, is anyone surprised? They spent a billion dollars this offseason. They should be here at the end of the day. Like, we are giving them a lot of credit, but if the Dodgers didn't make the World Series, this season would be an abject failure. Again, this furthers my point that Dave Roberts is just Ryan Day in a different sport. The head coach of Ohio State football. Like I don't know college football like that. I don't understand. So Robert Ryan Day is like Ryan Day lost one game to Michigan last year. And they're like, 
get him out of here. He's the <laughs> worst. And like this year, his quarterback slides, like his quarterback slides with two seconds left on the clock. They're a play away from beating Oregon. They are the best team in college football. But if they don't win the national championship, if they don't run the table, Ryan Day's on the hot seat. Like that's Dave Roberts. If Dave Roberts doesn't get it done this month, it doesn't matter if you win 120 games. Yeah. Your ass is on the hot seat. Yeah, And he's getting it done. And the Dodgers, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you get there. It's very NBA of them where, like, you can load manage your way through 82 games, but let's get to May and June in the NBA calendar, and you better win because that's what everybody's going to watch and everybody's going to remember. That's the L.A. Dodgers. The Dodgers are the most NBA team in Major League Baseball. Also, good on you. How many different sports have you woven into this podcast so far? We're field hockey, NBA, college football. Yeah, but you field haven't had your daily just like, college basketball reference yet. Field hockey is just like your prep nugget. Yeah, somebody called <laughs> me out on YouTube about mentioning the NCAA tournament, and I was like, wow, I feel bad about it now, so I'm not going to do it moving forward. Do it while we're uh, <laughs> who are the I, Yankees I can't, in terms though, of because, a college basketball team Kansas no but like but we had <laughs> we had four games in one day and I was like oh this feels like the NCAA tournament you know <laughs> what I mean so that's what I got there um but yeah two cross sport references in the same comparison for the LA Dodgers but um that's where we're at should we do the uh the ALCS now let's do the ALCS game for that oh yeah quick break break it's my turn ladies and gentlemen game four Yankees win 8-6. Top of the first. Glaber Torres single to lead it. Juan Soto hits his second home run of the postseason off Gavin Williams. 2-0 Yankees. Oh, man, I can't. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through this. I'm smiling too much. Let me let me try. I'm a <laughs> professional. Bottom first. The Guardians did score. Stephen Kwan walks. Kyle Manzardo doubles. Jose Ramirez sack fly to score the first run for Cleveland. 2-1 Yankees. Top second. Austin Wells. We talked about it. Gotta move down in the order. Just didn't seem right. Not that, that the moment was too big. He just seemed in between. It wasn't the same Austin Wells that we've seen all season long. Get a little more comfortable down there in the eight hole. Hits his first home run of the postseason. It's 3-1 Yankees. Bottom three. Stephen Kwan singles again. He, I tweeted out Stephen Kwan over Arias, and I got zero pushback. Zero. I thought that was going to be a contentious take, but everyone's like, no shit. I was like, oh, I guess we're here now. Yeah, why would it be why would it be a contentious take? Like you've got a guy that is a have you heard how MLB Network talks about Luis Arias the next Tony? Because they love batting titles. I'm just saying that's what most people absorb. Most people absorb MLB Network and they're hearing from all of the panelists, all these former players, smart people that I all respect all telling us that Luis Arias, like some people were saying Luis Arias is the best hitter in baseball. No, false. Th- th- those were things being told by like well-known respected yeah, baseball minds. I know they mean bat to ball. Like they mean, you know, the pure hitter thing. Like, Oh, the goal is to make contact and find is, places where hitters aren't. But is Steven Kwan a better bat to ball guy than Luis Arias? I think so. Steven, they are, they are on a similar playing they're on they're on a similar playing level there um the the huge separator is one of them is a gold glove defender in left and the other is like a below average defender at second base at first yeah but actually he was kind of good at the postseason at first yeah he's 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 quick he's twitchy he's very (laughs) he's a twitchy first baseman if you have a twitchy first baseman i think you just pass the eye test well he's twitchy everywhere like he has wrists from god yeah. I mean, that's how his bat to ball is. Like, you're never going to see him strike out. The thing is, I'm just sick of all the ground outs. But whatever. We're not talking about him. We're talking about Fair. Stephen Kwan, who led off the inning with a single again. Steals second again. Josh Naylor, RBI single. Yankees got a 3-2 lead. So, Gavin Williams and Luis Heal, they kind of gave us exactly what we thought. Gavin Williams, two and a third, three earned. Luis Heal, four innings, three hits, two earned, three walks, three strikeouts. Luis Heal, the command wasn't necessarily there for him. And I'm a little bit afraid of him getting a start against the Dodgers, but he is nasty and he gave the Yankees a chance to win. Gavin Williams, I thought, showed really good stuff, right? He had four strikeouts through two and a third. He was averaging 99 miles an hour with the fastball. Thing is, he ran into the dump truck that is the New York Yankees. You dump it in the zone, they're going to dump it in the seats. That just, it is what it is. I'm sorry, Gavin Williams, you could have been throwing 107, but just like Barry Bond says, just be if the catcher's got to catch that 107 mile an hour fastball, 
I changed a glove to a bat. Yeah. And that's basically what the Yankees are, a bunch of Barry Bonses, or at least that's what they are in my mind. Mm-hmm. Top sixth. Yeah. One soda walks. Again, Aaron Judge singles. Beast. Jazz bunts them over. Good baseball IQ there, Jazz. None of that even mattered. G. Carlos Stanton. G. Carlos Stanton hits his fourth of the postseason. Off noted better than tried it reliever Cade Smith. I'm just kidding. Cade Smith is amazing. It's phenomenal. He's been bullying people with that fastball all season long. Led all relievers in F4. Unbelievable pitcher. The thing is, the Guardians use him for two innings every game of the bow season so far. I bet his arm's about to fall off, and Giancarlo Stanton just went, yeah, yeah. You just can't throw it in the zone against him in the playoffs. Bottom seven. So at this point, it's 6-2 Yankees. Brian Rokio walks. Stephen Kwan singles. Jose Ramirez doubles down the line to score Rokio. And Quan goes to third. Naylor then doubles again, scoring both Quan and Ramirez. Guardians close the gap. It's 6-5 Yanks. Bottom eighth, Bo Naylor doubles to start it, moves to third on a ground out, and then David Fry hits a little tweener to Mark Leiter Jr., tosses to Anthony Rizzo, can't catch it, scores a run, it's 6-6, and I am shitting myself. I got doo-doo in my pants, Jack. Yeah, yeah. I'm watching all my hopes and dreams fall apart as Guardians magic gets us. I said, who's going to be the best in the margins? The Guardians, I just felt it all coming. But then Anthony Rizzo singles to start at the top of the ninth. Volpe then singles as well. Verdugo reaches on an error from Brian Rocchio. Scores a run at 7-6 Yankees. Glaber singles again, scoring Volpe. 8-6 Yankees. And we move. And we're the winner. And man, I let out the biggest sigh of relief. Thank God. <laughs> swore we were losing that one. I mean, swore. Yeah. The Guardians had all the momentum. The fact is that the Yankees, they just put together consistently, consistently great at-bats when the moment needs it, and they did it again in the ninth. Did it again in the ninth. You ready to move on to the next game, or you got any big takeaways from this one? No, I like. I think four, five, and six were exactly what baseball needed pre-World Series. Yes, especially with the Mets-Dodgers series, two incredible teams. For- Sorry, three, four, and five were exactly what we needed pre-World Series. We didn't get any good games. Mets fans would admit that. Dodger fans would admit that, right? You won the game, so you're probably happy about that. You lost the game, so you're upset about that. But every single game was won by four or five. This series, every single game was down to the wire. I remember I was on the phone with my dad uh, before this game started, and he was like, who do you think is going to win? Like, what do you? how do you think Heal's going to do? I was like, it doesn't matter how Heal does. It doesn't matter how Gavin Williams does this is going down to the end it doesn't matter if it's cole versus me on the guardians this game is going down to the end and it's gonna be who's gonna get the big hits and the big spots and the yankees again we talked about it just overwhelming talent and when you just have that and it's kind of on the guardians not spending any money right this almost feels like they're sealing at this point you can only get so far by having one of the lowest payrolls in baseball and forcing magic onto everybody. Now, I love the Guardians. Love them to death. Always have. Eh, that's not true. Quantrill joins the Guardians, and I instantly love them. Yeah. But this is the ceiling, unfortunately. Like, it's Will Brennan versus Giancarlo Stan in the five hole. So, disagree on that front. What do you disagree with? I disagree that this is the ceiling. I think that they can win a World Series. I don't think what they can in, win a World Series. What ingredients are they this? missing? What? Tell me the ingredients that they're missing. I think they're missing consistent power bats. Consistent power bats. The S at the end of bat is really important there. It's lifting a lot because they have a guy that was a homer away from 40-40. Yes. And they have a guy in John Kensi Noel who, as a rookie, is broken out with some big homers and a men's yeah. Zardo. Like, there's the strength Not in consistent numbers. Consistent power bats, though. I know, consistent. Yeah, that like consistent and then bats. You have J Ram there. But when it comes to the big ball, I hear you like they're playing a quantity game with Noel, with Manzardo next year with DeLauder. Like, they have all these guys that are going to factor in, but they don't have a second Jose Ramirez. Like, they don't have a judge to compliment, or they don't have a Soto to compliment judge. I'm going to be really mean here, but it's honest, and it kind of backs up my point. I have 
80 years of evidence. They haven't won a World Series since 1948. Yeah. Like, th- if you if you don't spend at least a little bit of money and fill these holes, you're not going to get there. You just aren't. These teams are too good. The Dodgers spent a billion dollars. A billion this offseason. Yeah, but like... Like, the Yankees we're... spent $300 million. The Mets, the other team in there, $300 million. It's just, it's overwhelming. And that's not we're... like a, a diss at the Guardians players. For what they spent... This was as good of a team as humanly possible. The front office for what they had to deal with, because it's the ownership. It's not the front office's fault. It's not the player's fault. I'm not blaming any of them. Yeah. You can only go as far. I mean, we're seeing it. It's Dodgers, Yankees, right? You can get there if you're the Rangers, who also spent a ton of money. The Diamondbacks even spent money and had a better team than the Guardians did. Like, the Guardians just didn't have enough firepower to get to the World Series. So I I can appreciate your point about offensive firepower, but I will say we were two par for the course outings from a guy with a 0.61 ERA this year away from talking about game six right now. Like we were two non throw up on yourself innings from Emmanuel class a from getting you ready for game six, 2016 game seven. They did not get there because they had bona fide superstars everywhere and they spent a ton. They were a good amount of them, though. They had a they had had more talent on that team, the team that faced off against the Cubs. I'm not sure about that. I mean, look at the starting rotation that they currently have now. It's Bybee and then Boyd and Cobb and no, I mean that was brutal. But like, if they had Shane Bieber right now, like, don't forget Shane Bieber was supposed to be around. Yeah, I mean, if they had Bieber and McKenzie all pitching at the top of their game maybe I but can't. i'm telling you right now like if they replayed this series jack if they replayed this seven game series and you simulate it right we have all of our gambling models over here if you did it a thousand times how many times are the guardians winning that series i don't think the number sub 45 percent. i think it is i think it's like the yankees probably win that series 65 percent of the time i i disagree with that if Yankees one had, and five, and and we're playing the hypothetical thing. We're playing the, uh, you're saying like including a Bieber and including a good McKenzie is what you're saying, or no? I mean, you're saying team team as I'm constructed this team, right now. I'm saying this team we oh win this 65%. team I'm with you. It's sixty five percent yeah with Bybee and McKenzie pitching at the top of their game in a perfect world. I mean, the Yankees yeah, like I just too. I just don't think it's fair to say that ownership capped this team at the ALCS at the outset, which is what I feel like you were saying there. I am kind of saying that. Yeah, and I disagree on that front. I just I didn't see them getting farther than this moment against the Yankees team, and I think in my mind, and I have eighty years of them not getting to the mountaintop. And especially in the 21st century, not really having much of a payroll going from within. And like that can get you to an ALCS. I just don't know if that ever is going to win you a World Series. I mean, the best version of the Guardians got to a World Series against the Cubs and didn't win it. Right. And that I thought that team was better. And I think Guardians fans would agree. Like, I just think that if you're not going to be in the top 15, now there's going to be that baseball is an incredible sport. Maybe I'll be wrong about one team one day, but it does feel like, for example, <laughs> even the Rangers, they spent all that money. They went up against the Diamondbacks. What they do? They crushed them. It's just yeah. overwhelming amounts of talent that is being paid for, right? The Yankees essentially paid to get to the World Series. The Dodgers paid to get to the World Series. The Guardians did not. So why do I think that they could maybe make it just some more magic? Like, that's why I think they were capped here. So... Francisco Lindor had a 106 WRC plus. Uh, come back Jay- to that team. <laughs> yeah, Jason Kipnis had a 109. Mike Napoli Kipnis. had a 106. Tyler Naquin, a rookie, finished third in rookie of the year voting at a 128. Carlos Santana had a 123. He was their best player. Now, they had Kluber, Carrasco, Bauer, Salazar, all kicking ass. Otero was awesome for that team. Brian Shaw was good for that team. And they got Miller at the deadline. And that was like, that was the thing. They have a better bullpen this year than they did. That's undeniable. I think the offense is frankly comparable this year to what they had in 2016. We could go, you want me to go through the Guardians numbers this year? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that they had a guy that came anywhere close to what Jose Ramirez did for them in 2024. No shot. Jose, Jose Ramirez, Ramirez had a one four team. Yeah, superstar. Superstar. They, like, I think you need a superstar to win the World Series. And I am not sure that that Indians team in 2016 had the superstar winner there. Like, J-Ram at a 114 OPS plus, okay? Uh, Lindor at a 106. And I know that Lindor, like, he hit 300. He played gold glove defense. I get it. But um, I don't know. I like the ingredients. I mean, regardless, that team didn't win. The ingredients could be there. They They didn't win it, though. But they were an out away. Like I'm, I'm with you. You got to get across the finish line. I'm just saying, like, I don't think it's fair to say, like, hard and fast. You were not getting past the ALCS. Maybe not. I'm just saying, in general, if you were to simulate these seasons a thousand times, like the Guardians are very rarely getting past the ALCS. Like yeah. this was a top end outcome for this team. It's really Guardians hard. had a yeah. 78 and a half win total at the beginning of the season. That was below the Tigers and the Twins. The Guardians yeah. were plus 400 to win the division. That was behind the Twins and the Tigers, right? This team was, quote-unquote, an underdog. And the fact is that they won 90-plus games, got it all the way here. Like, if you simulated this current Guardian squad a thousand times, like, this is a 98th percentile outcome? 100th percentile is maybe beating the Yankees? Probably still losing to the Dodgers? I, I That's what I'm saying, like, these, I just don't, I think the Guardians need to spend more money in the offseason to fill up some of these holes. Now, that's for the offseason, but that's what I feel. Yeah, I agree to disagree on some of those fronts, but that's fine. We'll keep going. We'll talk about the Yankees win in uh, Game 5. Yeah. Um, Yankees win 5-2, to two, go to the World Series. <laughs> Bottom second, Josh Naylor singles. Bo Naylor doubles to bring home his brother. Guardians up 1-0. That was awesome. That was a really yeah. cool moment, I yeah. thought. I wasn't happy about it at the moment, but looking back on it now, that's really, really cool. Doubling yeah. home your brother. Uh, bottom fifth. That was the only scoring right now. Under Jimenez doubles. Stephen Kwan singles to score under Jimenez. 2-0 Guardians. Rodon was good. I mean, the line doesn't say he was very good four and two thirds two earned six k's but it was kind of the same start that cole had against these guardians looked really good early command got away from him and then it was just kind of over pitch count got a little elevated but i thought he was good not great good not fine either better than fine good is that fair yeah it is tanner bobby was better though five and two thirds six hits two earned five k's Throwing a shutout until the top of the sixth. Glaber singles, Juan Soto singles, and then Judge grounds into a double play. So there's only one guy on at this point. And then that big bad man, Giancarlo Stanton, walks again up to the plate. The future Hall of Famer hits a Stantonian blast. Fifth of the postseason, 117, 446 feet. The one mistake Tanner Bybee made all day. The one mistake. Thought he was brilliant. Brilliant. First inning, a little sketchy. But that's kind of been Bybee's MO throughout his career so far. Once he settles in and he starts blowing 97 past you, he's a phenomenal pitcher. That's why you even said you thought he was the second best pitcher left in the postseason. Right? We're talking about Cole maybe being number one, Yamamoto, Flaherty, whatever. You said Bybee, and he looked the part in this game yeah. against a stellar Yankees offense. But Stanton was just a little bit too much. Yeah. Top of the 10th. That's where the next scoring comes in. Okay, I got to be careful. <laughs> <laughs> I got to... Fuck it. It was the greatest at bat I've ever seen. Juan Soto homers off Hunter Gaddis to take the lead with two outs. Seventh pitch of the A-B. He's walking up there. I mean, this is the most locked-in person I could ever on the planet. Yeah. Spitting on everything. Sliders. Change-ups. Fallon balls off. Nodding at Gaddis. You can't. You can't get anything by me. Just staring him down. Death. Death stare at Gaddis. And then Gaddis makes one mistake. And Juan Soto, congratulations on your billion-dollar contract. <laughs> what a hit. 
what a moment. And I don't know. I, I was I'm still speechless from it, Jack. I tried to collect my thoughts. And that's what makes it arguably the greatest moment I've seen as a Yankee fan was it left me, the takes guy, the guy I could yeah. ramble about everything, speechless, jaw drop, just in awe, in awe of greatness, in awe of greatness. What did, what did he mouth to the dugout right after like the eighth pitch? Did he say I'm locked in or I'm on it? Like, Yeah, something like that. Something like that. I feel like you said, like, I'm locked in. Like, something like something Did you see to someone that. someone lip once he uh, hit the home run and he pimped it and he was like, you know, when he was like flexing and yeah. looking at the dugout, he said something in Spanish. <laughs> and you know what it translates to? What? I'm the best cocksucker. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I'm the best cocksucker. Just yelling at his dugout. Oh, pure cinema. He, the greatest movie I've ever seen. I know Jazz said 700. I think that's going to be the ballpark. Like, I was sitting there on the iPhone calculator in the airport this morning trying to just figure that out. And I'm like, I, okay, like, let's do, you know, Scherzer has, what, the highest AAV at this point? I mean, Otani's Otani. I'm not going to I'm not gonna factor Otani in. Scherzer Maybe got 43. Can, defer it. can we defer it? <laughs> probably like that's the thing that can happen no doubt i i'm sure he'll say like give me my money now <laughs> you know, let's do this um but i think 43.3 across the two-year deal for verlander and scherzer that the mets handed out is the highest aav we've seen in baseball history for a non-otani player i was doing essentially just 45 times 14 i think he's gonna want to get paid until he's 40 he, he turns 26 this week it may go somewhere else. The more I'm thinking about it, if I'm him, six years, 300, go back out in the open market, he's 25. Hit the open market yeah, again when he's 31. But, like, why do that when you can sign a 14-year, $630 million contract right now? Because you don't know what a Juan Soto contract at 31 is going to look like with this market that it keeps inflating every how, single year. But how can his uh, – We'll see with the TV deals. Could be. Like, RSNs are in a weird spot right now. You have no yeah, idea if... Someone's going to pay him. Yeah, but, like, the, the, I think there is a world where, like, the crazy, crazy inflated contracts plateau because it's not financially sustainable. I'm not saying it's going to happen right. forever, and I think you yeah. can correct within five years, but I do think that we could hit a couple-year stretch where it's like, Oh, those $300 million contracts just aren't really happening anymore because owners don't have the bandwidth to commit to that right now. Um, but if somebody like, I think if, if anybody but the Yankees is Juan Soto's employer to start 2025, the Yankees just fumbled the craziest like bag and situation you could imagine. Like this is the Yankee sweepstakes to lose. They Why are we going to talk about the Yankee break? sweepstakes to lose? Can we just enjoy them? Like, I got Mets fans on Twitter, like, have fun with him now. He's going to be a Mets soon. Everyone and shut up. Everyone. But, like, do you not agree? Like, the Yankees. I don't need to agree. To do this. I don't need to agree. Let's go win a World Series with him right now. Oh, God. all right. So you're pushing. <laughs> yeah, that's good to note. It's like, oh, I'm not going to deal with this right now. But I'm not dealing with it right now. Why would I? I? I think Brian Cashman should put 14 for 630 in front of him. That's 45 <laughs> per through his age 40, 40 season. Oh my gosh. And I I ask him if he says yes or no. I'd pay it. And I would buy yeah. as much food at the stadium as they need me to do it. I'll pitch in. The LaBelle steak sandwich, you and the Costco guys. Yeah. Two most I legendary didn't... people on the internet. So we've hit we've hit Hawk Tua and the Costco guys on this episode. This is and great. the Rizzler. We even and did the thing. Rizzler. We got the Rizzler too. The holy trinity of brain rot. Um yeah. <laughs> I mean I I am not far from that like greatest at bat that I've ever seen. I feel like there are swings, you know, that are bigger, like given the moment, all that stuff. But at the end of the day, the fact that he grinded against a reliever that was firmly sub two this year. Yeah, that's and thing. on the tenth I'm so glad pitch you, he did that. I'm so glad you brought that up. Hunter Gaddis is fantastic. He's phenomenal. He's, He's phenomenal. phenomenal. It's this not like the... he did this. 
like no Kasparius. disrespect to Daniel Hudson. Yeah, but like I'm even thinking a level up from that. Hey, hey Phillips, like let's Evan Phillips, the closer of the 2023 yeah. LA Dodgers. Like Gaddis and Phillips are not the same. Like Gaddis is a better reliever at this point than Evan Phillips is. And Soto wrung the towel dry of that AB and then hit that and reacted like that. That's why he's a $630 million player. Incredible. Best hitter I've ever seen, too. Um, because Judge is more prolific. He's more spectacular. But Soto. Per A-B basis. Uh, per A-B basis. And I was thinking back to, like, all right, Peter, relax. Best hitter you've ever seen. Calm down. I think he operates in at-bat better than Miguel Cabrera. I think he operates yeah, in at-bat I mean better than Albert Pujols. I'm just thinking about the greatest hitters I've ever seen. And yeah, you could say, well, Bonds is way better. Yeah, he was on steroids. Give me a break. Well, the, the definitions are weird because, like, my yeah. answer to that would be Ichiro because young True. me was like, oh, I'm, I'm obsessed with Ichiro. But, like, Soto, I think, works a better AB. Yeah, like, Soto does things better than Ichiro. Soto obviously has more juice, but Soto's, like, plate discipline is essentially unmatched, especially a guy in his, you know, early 20s. Um, so, like, I I hear where you're going. I just feel like we would need a cut and dry definition of, like, what, you know, working in it bad looks like. Because each year, like, to you. I'm telling you from my mind. So, what we'll do is the definition is just whatever I want to make it. Yeah. So, when I'm watching, I'll just give you the answer. So, you don't need to look anything up. You just have to trust me. I'm with you. Cool? So, <laughs> for me, based on my criteria, I think Nicky Lopez is <laughs> the most prolific defensive second baseman that the 2024 White Sox had to offer. And that's your opinion. What am I going to say? Am I going to go against <laughs> that? You can't. Yeah. <laughs> What's can't. the criteria? In my dome. <laughs> oh, man. Juan Soto hitting 333 with an 1100 OPS. Giancarlo Stan hitting 294 with a 1200 OPS. Anthony Rizzo hitting 429 with an OPS over 1000. Ah, judge didn't even really do much and it didn't matter. Labor Torres, what a stud ever since. Yeah. I mean, he's earning more money day by day. Yeah. Always been a Glaber guy. Always been a Glaber guy. Got it. Nope. Not true. <laughs> what are you talking about? I feel like you were anti Glaber at some point. I'll when? find some. I'll find, find some. it. We find can it. go to the receipts. Find it. No, you definitely ne had some anti. I've never said anything ever negative about the Yankees ever. About yeah. Any player. They're no, all I, I actually, I know where to go for receipts on that one too. <laughs> <Damn it. laughs> you're you're kind of there. Um, my last thing on this one, and again, we're we're doing a World Series preview on the Wednesday show. The commissioner's office is blasting the start of Dreams and Nightmares by Meek Mill right now. Yeah, they are they're like, if Hold this. Up, wait a minute, y'all thought I was finished. Man, I was it. thinking, I used to pray for times like, like this. <laughs> like, God, like this. We we just watched. D backs Rangers last year. And, like, hey, no disrespect to the Arizona Diamondbacks of the Texas Rangers, but this is different. Yeah, this is just different. And I think that World Series gets a little bit of too much hate. Rangers were so good. The Rangers were so good. It's just the Diamondbacks yeah, I'm were with lucky you. and the underdogs, but they were still a really good team, too. Beat the Phillies. They beat everybody to get there. And that's I'm with my you. Last but, like, thing. we were fired up about Jordan Montgomery and, like, Nathan Eovaldi. But we have Garrett Cole and Shohei Otani and Aaron Judge and Juan Soto and Freddie Freeman and Mookie Betts. Like, there's a lot here. So much here. Otani yeah. versus Judge. Or, and uh, Mookie versus Soto. You see my tweet, I, Yankees of, in four? Did you say that? My uh, One of my favorite followers on Twitter is Joe Pompliano, who does great like business of sports type stuff that he puts out. And he said, this series might make Fox a billion dollars. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Like, we are, we're there at this point. And you think about the global reach and, hey, it's the New York Yankees. They are a global brand. The L.A. Dodgers are a global brand. But Otani and Yamamoto in the World Series, Yamamoto's first year in Major League Baseball, Otani's first year with the real big market L.A. team, judge being judge. I saw Opta Stats put out. This is the first time that two fifty homer players are meeting in a World Series. First time ever that that's happening. I, I mean, you could not have put Major League Baseball in a better spot to succeed than with this World Series. 
And if they don't pull ratings that we haven't seen in a decade, then that's on them. It's the Yankees and the Dodgers. Everything you need to pitch your game to the masses is right effing here. So right, just do it. Yeah. My one worry. My one worry. Crowds. And here's what I mean by that. Have you seen the ticket prices of these games? Yeah, I I went to Austin, Texas this weekend, and I sat in a bar to watch Texas and Georgia because I have this thing where I'm not going to pay $600 to sit in the top row of a stadium and watch ants play football. And, like, that's the baseball conversation now, too. I don't think many people are going to be paying, what, $850, $900 getting the door price yeah i mean that's absurd there's gonna be no real fans there like i want the fans who pay the ten dollar tickets who are the most rowdy and the most fun and get the stadiums rocking yeah i mean yankees that, that Dodgers era might be gone yankee stadium dodger stadium it's gonna be the biggest work events for apple and chase bank and it's gonna suck so what i'm hoping what I am praying is that these teams figure out a way to get real fans in this stadium. The fans, the season ticket holders, the fans who have been there every single day, the fans who have just, they pay for parking, they pay for food, and they can only afford to go to one game in a season because it's already so expensive to go to these games in general. Those fans deserve to be at those games, and they would make the the games better. Yeah, like The overall atmosphere would be so much better. And I really, really hope that these two teams notice this and are able to maybe not lower the ticket. I don't know what they no, have to do. The, but the live like event, live events are so far off the deep end right now. Like no. concerts. I mean, concerts are crazy. Crazy. Sporting events are crazy. Um, I, I, would think that there is some sort of lottery system going on for like season ticket holders and things yeah. like that. So I, I'm sure that that's happening right now and you will get some of that, but it is going to be a, a priced out fan base, no doubt. And like, uh, I want to go to a world series game. I can't afford it. Yeah, I get it. I get it. It's, it, it's just one of those. It's like, do you really want to sit in the top row of Yankee stadium down the right yeah. field corner? Like, like, I could probably oh, afford really? that. I can't afford good seats where I can watch the game. I'd rather just watch it on Fox. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, it's going to be awesome. That, that that was my one worry that I did want to bring up, which I think stinks. But that's the only thing that stinks. Yeah. Because this is cinema. This is this the is greatest. Yankees Dodgers. This is Yankees Dodgers. Oh, I can't wait. And we're going to do our World Series preview predictions that will come out probably Wednesday. We want to prep a little bit more, want to make sure all the guys are healthy so we can give you all the information that we possibly can to also make the best prediction possible. Spoiler alert, Yankees in four. Yeah. Um, but so that's what we're going to do. And then Monday, Jack and Arm are probably going to do something great. And then we'll get you that big World Series preview with the three of us on Wednesday. So appreciate everybody listening. Unless, Jack, you got anything left? I don't think so. I'm not wearing any merch. Why would I? Is it is one in the morning. <laughs> so, yeah, don't be like Jack. Go get your Just Baseball merch. I got mine on. Go get yours in the episode description, code JB15. But also, best way to support without spending a dime, because I assume people are saving up for a World Series ticket. I know I am. So I don't want to be spending dimes right now. I get it. Just rate and review. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, best way to support this show. Leaving a written review, greatly, greatly appreciated. It's the best way to support. It helps this podcast grow. And then as well liking the video on YouTube, subscribing on YouTube. For Jack McWill and I'm Peter Apple. The Yankees are going to the World Series. And with that, <laughs> the Dodgers are too. Eh, kind of. With that, thank you, everybody.